Hi, this is Steve. This is Bob. This is Jay. We are Alpha Quadrant 6, a science fiction review show. And on this episode, we have a special guest, Brian Trent, our good friend and award-winning and best-selling science fiction author. Brian, welcome back to the uh, to uh, Alpha Quadrant 6. It's always fun to be here. Thanks for having yeah. me. Uh, we were going to be talking about a couple of topics that we thought you would be especially good for. We're going to start in this episode. This is actually the first of a five-part series that we're doing on the elements of good speculative fiction, good science fiction and fantasy. This uh, episode is going to focus on world building, right? What is world building? That is creating the universe in which your story takes place. Uh, there's good world building out there. There's terrible world building out there. And it really has a dramatic effect on the quality of, a, of even a, a short story, let alone a full novel or a franchise, a series, whatever. Um, my uh, personal example of, I think, the best world building in speculative fiction is Tolkien's Lord of the Rings yes. series. I think yeah, that's without a doubt. Probably a popular a popular choice. Jay, what would you pick as near as in your top top few? I mean, I have to I have to give a nod to Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Um especially because right now there's been so much writing in that universe. I mean, yeah. there, there's been an incredible amount of world building, but if you go all the way back to the very first Star Wars uh, movie, which was episode 4, um it was remarkable. Mhm. Mm how good the writing was and the world building was. I mean, I remember watching it for the first time and and be, being obsessed with that universe. Yeah, you want to be in that universe. Yeah. That's a good good uh, good marker of good world building. What about you, Bob? Uh, well, speaking of wanting to be in another another universe, Star Trek. I got to yeah. give a nod to oh, yeah. Star Trek. I mean, especially after how many series, how many books, how many movies, how many you know mm. comics even. Uh, it it is it is very well fleshed out from from many different angles. And, uh, and of course, we're all just huge, fan, huge fans of Star yeah. Trek. Come on. And what about you, Brian? I mean, those are all great examples. And they're all historical, which is interesting. Yeah. I mean, even the first Star Wars movie begins at episode four, right? In the middle of the dissolving right. of a Senate and so forth, we were talking. Um, I would say Dune is probably yeah. one of my favorite science fiction Dune. examples. Absolutely. It's a rich uh. universe, covers thousands of years of history. Even when the first book begins, um, you've already had an AI revolution in the past. You've right. already had the discovery of uh, interstellar travel and uh, and all these different factions to make it up. There's a way of conveying all that information without it seeming boring right. through interesting characters and the the politics of these factions jockeying for power. It's great stuff. Yeah, so we're already alluding to a lot of the elements of good world building, but just to frame it up a little bit. So, um, we're, you know, a lot of people like the standard metaphor for what world building does to for a story or a franchise. It's like the tip of an iceberg, right? The 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 part of an iceberg that's above the water line is the story. That's the part that the reader or the viewer sees. Mm -hmm. But the world is the iceberg below the water that you don't see. But that's holding up the story, and the writer needs to have a pretty good idea about the whole iceberg, right? There has to be a fully fleshed out world there for the story to take place. Um, otherwise, it seems hollow and flat. Like mm -hmm. you can't create the illusion that your characters are living and going on their adventure in an actual place unless you have some idea about what that place is like and what it, what its history is and what are the conflicts that are going on there and who inhabits that world. So uh, let's let's talk about some of the elements of of good world building uh, itself. So Bobby, Nate, once you, you I know you have a, your list of like the the main elements. Yeah, there's lots of ways to dissect this, yeah. right? So here's one example of how it, it can be dissected. So one type of world building that's common and and very important is, is physical world building. This is the foundation. This is the physics of your world, how it works, and whether it's magical. Ma yeah. Having a magical world is part of your physical world building. After that, then becomes technological world building, which, which we all love, of course. Technological world building is specific pieces of technology that without it, your plot and everything would fall apart. Mm -hmm. So it's critically, it's critically important. So for example, um, um, in Star Wars, the fact that they have ships that can go 
you know, faster than the speed of light, yeah. FTL. It's critical to the world building. Yeah. Right. The world with FTL. Right. Yeah. In my example, altered carbon with the stack technology yeah. where you're mined. Without that, you have no story at all. It or, is the story. Or yeah. Isaac Asimov's robot series. The robots. Without the robots, you've got nothing. So, the, so that's an example of technological world building. There's also cultural world building, which is all about relationships. In, in relationships yeah. one-on-one or between between among the entire society. It could be religious. It could be political. It could mm-hmm. be even sexual um, mm-hmm. And great examples, of course, are Game of Thrones, Handmaid's Tale. Great examples of that type of world building. Yep. The other, the last example that that I focused on was um, biological world building. Yep. So these are the these are the the living the living aspects of your world, whether it's flora, flora fauna. fauna, aliens, dragons, all of those that are critical to your story that are extremely important. And probably the best franchise for that. Is Avatar? Yeah, Avatar. I would agree. Avatar, Avatar was good, and even even Quantum Mania had yeah. had this this built up uh, environment, you know, fantastical environment that was that was I thought was beautiful. Speaker for the Dead by Orson Scott Card um, helped to pioneer, helped to at least popularize the idea of a of a world with um, the flora and the fauna was pivotal to even mm-hmm. how people were trying to colonize it mm-hmm. um, and how different life forms interacted. So the idea that we're we're saying here is that when when a a writer, an author, someone writing a movie script, um, you know, when they sit down and they start writing, they might not start actually writing anything that has to do with dialogue mm-hmm. or, or, you know, they're they not might, writing the story. They're, they're writing just sitting the background. There, they're thinking, yeah. what is this world? You know, where, where is this story starting? Who are the, the, the physical world building? Yeah. Like yeah. where do the characters that I'm going to eventually talk about, where do they live? What do they do? What is their daily life? Like, like just coming up with details and like, so token Stevie, Oh my God. Like we talk about not he only wrote more backstory than story. Yeah. Right. That's like an extreme example, but it, it plays out so well. well I want to just flesh out what Bob said a little bit more so you could break down those categories somewhat. So yep. I, the the um, the physical world building is what I typically call the metaphysics of the world. Like what, what how does the universe work? Is there magic? If there is magic, how does it work? Is there a supernatural level to this universe or is it completely naturalistic? The technology is a great one. What is it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that technology is the focus of the plot line. You just have to know what's the level of technology yeah. in your world, right? Even like Lord yeah. of the Rings has medieval level technology, or you can have an age of exploration level technology, or modern technology, or how advanced is it? Is it just a little advanced beyond us? Is it super advanced technology? Mm-hmm. Um, and Cultural. then when you talk about and also the physical part of the world is like the map. Yeah, like, right, exactly. There, there, there has to be, where is everything? Is it multiple worlds? If it's one planet, what's, what's literally, what are the continents? What's the relationship physically? When you say I'm traveling from A to B, well, what direction is that in? Yeah. What do you have to go through to get there? How long, How does long it take? is it going to take <laughs> yeah. you to get there? If you don't know those things, you, it's big, you, right. your story is going to be inconsistent and it's not going to make sense. And you're going to sort of break that contract with, you're not going to get the trust of your reader or your viewer because you're going to violate the internal consistency of your own world. And like that's, you can, that's the cardinal it, sin, though. Yeah. In consistency. If you break that, yeah. I mean, we'll give you lots of gimmies and you can make all sorts of fantastical things. But if you're not internally consistent, to me, that is that is the cardinal sin. That's the problem you want to avoid at all costs because that's where you're like, oh, come on. I, and, you know, you and can't I would say, trust anything. And, I, and, and building on that, I would say you don't want to introduce game breaking bugs. Once you create the rules, you have to abide by them. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. So that's, you know, once you have created the cinematic version of Lord of the Rings, um, or the, the Middle Earth, rather, the moment you move into, like, The Hobbit and you're introducing giant worms, you're asking, well, why yeah. weren't they at Homes Deep? Why were, yeah, wasn't yeah, requisitioning yeah. them a little more important than getting war elephants? Um, you right away, you kind of, you, you you violate that trust right away. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that, you know, you a good world builder tries to think things through logically and then build logically yes. on that foundation where it all comes down. Yeah, and like it's using Star Trek as an example of breaking your world building with technology. It's yeah. like, oh, we could transport to different planets now. Yeah. Really? So then why do we need ships? Right? And right. why can't you just invade a planet by just transporting a million soldiers there? Or a million bombs. Or I mean, whatever. Yeah, why can't you just beam a bomb, you know, onto into a city or whatever? So they they introduce technology. That's the that's one of the pitfalls of doing like doing really detailed world building is that you, your details don't line up. Right. You know, if, right. if you, if you give yeah. yourself a lot of wiggle room, you can always retcon everything when you have to, because mm. you're, you're only giving like a, a glimpse a broad brushstroke. And that's sort of the soft to hard 
world building spectrum. Like soft is you're just giving like a glimpse through a window and hard is you are in the world like Game of Thrones. You know, every sub cousin of whatever, you know, relationship and, you know, intimately the map of Westeros mm -hmm. you know, that you could live in that world. But if you do that, man, you better have your facts better line up right. and you have better thought through the implication of every thing you are introducing into your world. And, you know, it's it's not that difficult for someone to sat down and said, wow, if our star, if our tra uh, transporters can do this, we just undid everything. Yeah. yeah. It's it yeah. just kind of it's yeah. almost scornful. Some yeah. of those inventions. They did it, five minutes of thinking that through. Really have, pissed off the, the, the fans. Yeah, so for a lazy, reason. It's lazy yeah. writing. It's lazy, it's lazy writing, writing and it's yeah. it's contempt, I think, for the idea. Now, yes. In terms yeah. of the relationships, I mean, I, I think we could split that out a little bit further, too. So I think you have to understand the geopolitics of your yeah. world. That is so critical. Mm -hmm. Star Wars does that so well. At least the first six movies, seven, eight, nine was utter crap. It completely broke it, it, the Star Wars world building. Correct. You have no idea. Well, we'll get to that when we talk about how bad things are. But like, you have no idea who, who, how big the Republic is and how big that was it the First Order. Like, what? The, you didn't know anything about the world. Uh, but like with Lord of the Rings, you know exactly where the power is and where the conflicts are and who owns the power and that this guy is not the king. He's just the steward of the king and what that means. Um, there's also the history. history. History is so important. Mm -hmm. And then Lord of the Rings, you're walking past history in every scene. Yep. And there's it's so deep. And and Tolkien knew like this many thousand year history of this world. More than that, if you count the Silmarillion. Yeah. The Balrogs weren't just demons, they were fire spirits in the dawn of creation. Yeah. Right. I see there. I see somebody in the chats mentioning Mass Effect also. I mean, Mass Effect is a great world building example for video games because they have billions of years of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so when you visit billions. another planet, billions of years. Billions. So, you, so you have billions and billions. <laughs> uh, you have um, you know, multiple layers of civilizations that yes. have come and died and come and died throughout the years, almost like layers of um, of sediment. Because a real world has history. Yeah. If you feel like you're in this snapshot, you feel lost. Like there's just nothing you don't feel like grounded in anything. I we were talking just before. Before we, we we started recording the video about Star Wars, the, the you know the A New Hope, the the first movie that that aired, where um, uh, Grand Moth Tarkin walks into the council room with Darth Vader, and you know one of the one of the people there is saying, Do you, "How are you going to get this past the Senate?" And he's like, "You know the Emperor has disbanded the Senate. You know the final remnants of the old Republic have been swept away." Like there was so uh, much history in that right, one just line. That, and that was all geopolitics and history. And we are moving through history. We're picking up a story in the middle. All of yeah. those things. Because and it's they, no coincidence. Yeah. It's no coincidence that the best brands out there have I've, this element, have these absolutely. elements. Like we, right, Brian? Like I, I just thought of another one, Babylon 5. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, now, Babylon excellent. 5. Now, what's, what's interesting is I, I love Star Trek as much yeah. as anybody. Okay. A lot of, but it's a little always curious. How everybody's at the same level of technology for the most part. Right, right. Yeah. In Babylon 5, you had like the first ones. You had the yes. other races that were, that were thousands, even millions of years ahead. You had the Vorlons and the Shadows who had been in the galaxy for, for eons. They were before. like deific at they that were, point. They were, they were yeah. practically almost cosmological, yeah. almost, you know, Lovecraft level without mm -hmm. the madness. And mm -hmm. that battle at the end when their ships When their show show up, exactly. Was, oh my God, it's <laughs> orgasmic. <laughs> but, but not only that, Brian, not only is there different levels of technology at the same time, but technology is changing through history. Mm -hmm. Star yeah. Trek does that really well. Yeah. You go back to Star Trek Enterprise and they're at lower tech. They don't have the transporter yet. They're had Tractor they beams. They have the... They don't, yeah. yeah. And then you know, each sort of, each generation, the technology evolves. You yeah. can feel as if Star Wars did that in, to some extent. Yeah. Like the earlier movies, the smaller ships needed a bigger thing to connect to to go FTL. In later movies, the X-Wings could go FDL all by themselves. Yep. You but not see... so much, though, for Star Wars, though. Yeah, right? well, that, but that's because they were, it was disrupted. You know, like yeah. the Empire was falling down. It was almost like, a sta it almost like stagnated, almost but like Lord of the Rings. Like yeah. it's kind of, there wasn't, they, they reached a certain point and then sort of just sort of atrophied in decadence. Mm -hmm. right. Um, right, right. As long as it fits with the history. It fits though, with the history. Yeah, it worked. Right, it absolutely right. worked for it. Yeah, so, yeah. And, then, and then the end result is, you know, I like to click back to, uh, to Lord of the Rings. You know, the end result is that when the story is finally being told, there is a richness yes. there that that no author can fake. Mm -hmm. You can't fake this. You really can only get there one way, and that's by doing exquisite world building. Right, writing the backstory. Yeah, exactly. Like when Gandalf throws out these phrases that are like little these little Easter eggs about you know, like fire will ruin whatever. Yeah, it's like okay, but. 
you you put the words in that character's mouth because that character is a part of a world with history, yeah. and you also can, you know it, it helps the story. So this is now what? How does world building help your story? Help the the whole thing? Because it it informs your characters, mm -hmm. right? Because now your characters are from someplace with a culture and a history, right? In in Star Wars, you have people who are from. Alderaan, who survived the destruction of Alderaan, and they now have a history. I think part of the reason why Boba Fett was such a compelling character was because he suggested, oh, that he is. What is that armor? And you know, he's like from this uh, this uh, lost um, tradition, this lost culture that was. Well, what happened to it? It was destroyed by the Empire. Well, how did that happen? And you can, and it's it's like a. Um, what do you call it, like a Mandelbrot series? What do you, what do you, Fractive, you fractal. It has infinite depth. Yeah, the, the yeah. more you zoom in, then you you keep yes. finding more and more detail. You never it's get fractal, to the bottom. Yeah. Uh, so it helps your characters. It helps your plot because the conflict is already there. It helps your setting because now the, the places are all connected and your world is full of its own history and, and people and everything. But, but we got to keep in mind yeah. that they're not writing... Even the best authors out there, like Tolkien, they're, they're not writing to such detail where it is infinite depth. You know, you could go it's all the, the way, but, but depth. they do just enough yeah. to where no matter who you are on the outside, when you look at it, you can't really see any of the scenes. But you, you, you never see the, all the information. It gets the, back to the iceberg, right? right? You're only seeing the part that's being shown to you. But if it wasn't resting on top of all of that stuff underneath it, it wouldn't fit together and it wouldn't work. You, you know what I mean? So, so the author the author creates a bank of knowledge yeah. that they tap into mm -hmm. where they need it. Yeah. But but again, you know, and we should we should refer to Brian because Brian has actually done this uh, more <laughs> yeah. than one occasion. Like, so Brian, what give us a very quick version of what that process is like. Well, I'll say, you know, with like, for example, my newest book, Red Space Rising, I wrote about 100 pages of backstory mm -hmm. because there's multiple, one thing to talk about, Cooper mm -hmm. culture. I always find it hollow when a science fiction or fantasy world only has like two groups. There's like yeah. the, uh, the bad guys and the good guys. That n has never been the case in right. history. You've got to have lots of factions. So like I created the corporations and the um, the, the religions in the future and the different... Um, Dune does that really well. Dune does yeah. it excellent. Yeah. Different political factions because all each... There's so many different dynamics and interplays and how these different groups relate. They create the world. Mm -hmm. you, you, can, you can create this set, but they actually are the ones who flesh it out. So you create backstories, but then you deliberately have some throwaway lines. Mm -hmm. Little yeah. references to things that you won't have the time because you don't right. live forever to come up with every single thing, but it's just there hanging like an ornament on a tree. And if you, and later on in writing, for example, I'm outlining the sequel right now, I'll look at some of those things that I hung out there and thought, you know what, maybe I can explore that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe I'll explore right. this. Maybe, and so that's what you, you need to do. It's the illusion of, of depth. Um, and, uh, and if you love the universe you create, then you're respectful of it and mm -hmm. you you build meaningfully off mm -hmm. of it. So yeah. Um, I was just thinking, um, yeah, and even in like a game like Mass Effect or Babylon 5, there's so many different alien races, Star Trek, so many alien races interacting, each with their own traditions, each with their own histories. Uh, that's what makes the universe rich and that's what people love, which why people fall in love with these universes. Yeah. And absolutely. you you know what's interesting is when you when you go to some schlocky sci-fi movie, right? Like we, Brian, you and I were talking about Krull, for example, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I, I can watch that and enjoy it just because it's really? got, well, because I saw it as a kid. It's campy. Uh, it's campy. It's but, totally campy. But why is it that we can instantly, like as soon as the first 30 seconds of that movie, you're like, oh, uh oh, it's, yeah. miss, it's missing the, the, the from gravitas. The, from the get-go, it's, it's missing something. The cinematography, the hollow. costumes, everything. It's flat. Yeah. But it's but, you know, one thing generic. though, going back to Star Wars for a minute, when you look at the ships, they've already been used. Mm -hmm. Some of them have holes in them. Some of them are rusted. Yeah, like, they all suggest the past battles. And without even just at a glance, you're like, that thing right there, that, you know, land speeder or whatever, has been around, mm -hmm. you know. It's and that almost, was a decision. That was a creative decision because it's brilliant. I, I remember yeah. it was surprising in in the day back then that, wow, th these ships aren't new. Shouldn't they be, shouldn't they look well, a little newer? Yeah. And they weren't. And it suggested They're that history. And that was a decision that was made. It was you know, an aesthetic you, that instantly, yes. as Jay was saying, instantly you're like, this is a lived in universe. I'm engaged. So you know, they the, cared about the, this. the Jawas, as an example in Star Wars, are scavengers. And scavengers can only exist in a, in a in a universe where there is st stuff, stuff to scavenge, scavenge right? Yeah. So that does add as well as like these little like side characters that mm. that could add 
a layer in there. And what's happening is unconsciously, it's it's gaining like it, it's gaining this gravitas and this mm. meaning. And as you, as you watch more and more, and these little things are getting filled in and everything, then you start to feel like this is a living, breathing yeah. thing. And yeah. that that's the goal. Any any good writer wants to get to the point where the audience is feeling that. There's an nope. interesting example in literature. Love, the Lovecraft uh, mythos did something where he, would, he created fake literature within his universe yes. that people would often refer to. Where there's Game the, of Thrones uh, did that. Piltdown yeah. 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 Shards, the, um, the Narcotic Manuscripts, the Necronomicon. Yes, Necronomicon. And, Necronomicon and they would kind of, it was the little touchstones so that different professors or cultists or whatever would refer to these things like, oh yes, we're still in the same universe, but we're looking and into this corner. Yep. And this yeah. story looks for this corner. It was like a mosaic. So the more stories you read, the more indoctrinated, if yeah. you will, you become mm -hmm. into that universe. Love now, it. Brian, my experience in terms of world building personally is in the genre where I think it is the most important, and that is role playing. Role playing. Because you, you, ha you ha are creating a universe, a world that other people literally have to adventure in, you know, and you're actually giving up a little bit of control over plot and character. But you're making up for it by just massive world building that mm -hmm. you throw people into. Well, in it's anything really that's a sandbox, it's so deep. Like video games have this as yeah. well, right? You know, you have this sandbox concept that yeah. you could walk in any direction, and there has to be something there. Right. You know what I mean? So, in, in tabletop role playing, it, it's at its most profound level because, you, as the person running a game, for example, you you either have to have the answers or make them up on the spot, mm -hmm. that, and they have to be consistent with the universe. Right, which is why I always created. like to write it ahead of time. But like, if you have a character, again, it's the same thing. Like this this character is from somewhere, and something happened to <clears> them, and they have motivation that derives from that, and so. I, you, when, when you're writing a script, when you're writing a story, you can put words in their mouth because you're totally controlling the situation. But imagine a character that you created is now interacting in real time with other people you don't control. You have to know how they're going to react to anything that somebody else can throw at them. Oh, don't we all know it at this yeah. table? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. well, yeah. I mean, we all know, we all know it say, That's why it's a, it's a really, it's why I think, I think yeah. I'm so enthusiastic about yeah. world building. And so, but you should be able to do that even if you're yeah. writing a story. Because then it becomes so much easier to do the writing when you know how a character could react. But that also translates directly to the viewer or the reader because like, we know how Han Solo is going to react in a situation yeah. because he's a real character mm -hmm. in a real world. We know how Captain Kirk is different than Captain Picard because they have different interpretations of the Federation you know, liberal world order that, that the Federation creates, whatever. We can, we can debate it. You can debate yeah, how yeah. different characters in these worlds are going to react, the, you know? And it, it's cliche, but it is true. If you if you create a fully dimensional character, a, a three-dimensional yeah. character, they will kind of write themselves. Yeah. I yes. mean, you, once, you, once you get them, once you know their language patterns, their, their philosophy, what motivates them, they sort of kind of take over a story. Yeah. Um, sometimes they will actually, people will consult the actor because that actor has lived the character more than, than anyone else. And mm -hmm. sometimes they will have an interesting input, an important input as to mm -hmm. how a character would react, their character would react in specific situations. Yeah, we had a, to, to quick mention, like the world of Harry Potter. Yeah. The, the world building in there, I thought was was 100% gold. And interesting because that exists in our world. Exactly. But they built a sub world yep. within our yep. world. And it, and it worked. And that's world building yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. And you're building sense. this world within a world. Because you, and the fact is like, you know, the, the author had to write how those two, where the seams how are and interact. how they interact and, yeah. and what are the, re it was great. and it's, what's cool is in, in, in that type of writing, you know, she had to write how they hide themselves and all of that stuff too, yeah. right? It's it's all yep. built into yep. the it's all built into Let, it. Let's talk quickly about like the worst examples where <laughs> where there was a failure of world building, and it's common. It's it's very common. Oh god! Yeah. And my favorite example is Star Wars seven, eight, and nine mm -hmm. because it contrasts with the wonderful world building of one through six. Yeah. Again, I'm not crazy about one, two, and three, but the world building there was actually quite good. They they extended and fleshed out the world building of four, five, and six very well. And then you hit seven, eight, and nine, which suffered so many problems, but was just an epic failure of world building because you have no idea what's going on in the in the galaxy. Yep. You don't know what the real status of you know. First of all, there's just you have the generic good guys and the generic bad guys, and you know, who, you know, where are they from? What are their goals? What are their motivations? What are they doing? What's the, what's the, the sixth order 
the first order was it the first order the, the first order yeah what are they trying to do how many worlds do they control how do they create a multiple planet killing weapon how right they, under the nose yes. of the new republic where are yeah, they getting yeah. their resources from I know. why and why did they choose that same failed strategy for a third time i mean it's remarkable <laughs> it's remarkable because in this instance we're coming from rich world building. Mm -hmm. Like they had everything they there laid it. out. It, they had everything laid out in front of them. They just had to go, okay, who's still alive? What what groups are still in power? What what are the main planets? Where are the hubs of power? And they could have extrapolated from there. But this, and we've seen this happen to both Star Wars and Star Trek on a profound level that the new people come in and they're like, they they expunge yeah. the history. It's, it's just, it's pure laziness. Yeah. And, and, and I think the, to me, the greatest example of that is the Star Trek reboot where you have an already established rich world, right? Mm -hmm. And you he Abrams destroys it from the word go. Just mm -hmm. saying, you know what? Well, there's a time travel thing that happened and none of that happened. So why are you even creating in this universe then? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. You already and nobody can say, well, he wanted to be free to find his own story. There's plenty of yes. stories in Star Trek. Oh my God. Captain Kirk's history is he's a survivor of, of genocide, yeah, right? Yes. He came from a planet right. where the governor went like Thanos and everybody. That was worth exploring. You don't <laughs> right. turn him into, and then it creates other logical inconsistencies. You want to show Kirk as a troubled youth, so he steals a muscle car and is blasting Beastie Boys, which is the equivalent of trying to show a troubled youth of today stealing a horse and buggy while the a fiddler in the back plays a shanty. Right. It just doesn't yeah. make sense. This yeah. is 300 years in the future. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, I, I would even go one step back from that, Bri, and say, why the hell are you writing stories about characters that already exist? Like, this is a universe where there's unlimited depth. You can yeah. go to anywhere. You can you can create new characters. I can't stand the idea that they went back and retreaded these these characters that already did their thing. It's all about risk. It's, it's all about fun. risk, yeah. risk and, and, returning, and return on the investment and current Kirk and everyone is a known entity, so they got, they feel they got to go with that, and it's frustrating. But, but, but that's world the, building is risk, and yes. and but, risk. That's why we're a but border. You can't succeed without without taking that creative risk. Yeah, and I, I, and it just amazes me how over and over again we see that, and yet it does doesn't doesn't sink in. I don't understand. I'll give you I'll give you an example of yeah. of something from Star Wars real quick. So we have um, Darth Vader. And Obi Wan Kenobi meet at the at the you know towards the end of the uh, first Star Wars movie, Episode four. four. Yeah, and they have a lightsaber battle. Yes, and by today's standards, it was a very low quality, yeah. very low energy yeah. fight. I mean, if you watch it, it's like watching paint dry. And that and that's in, it's interesting in a way because there's a lot there's a lot of real world reasons why that battle was was at that low level because they didn't have the technology the the lightsabers were breaking yeah you know they didn't they didn't know where it was going to go right so when you compare it to the the stuff that we get to digest today and it's nothing i mean think about how well obi-wan would have been able to use that lightsaber mm -hmm. at that point with darth vader like and it's been you know, done right they've got videos oh, on yeah. youtube to show that ex exact scene reimagining in that a scene way with that just blows technology. your mind yeah. like that's how it should have but been. but there are moments of these problems that are in good properties, you know, good brands mm -hmm. that we love. That but meanwhile, they're smack talking each other the whole time, revealing their deep history oh, yeah. with each other. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's why it was compelling. We didn't give a shit that the lightsaber foul battle was mediocre. We were listening to the smack talk. I was just going to say, right. you know, you can have, there for the I was just going to say, that's what matters to me. I don't need all the acrobatics necessarily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we understood the characters and that there was a sense of history there. I'll watch, you know, the Enterprise um, withdraw in Star Trek Three when Kirk steals the Enterprise. All it is is the Enterprise backing up, and then he goes to warp. That's yeah. all that happens, and that is a damn exciting scene. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, way yeah. more exciting than you know CGI overload with you know constant explosions, people are running around and screaming, and and then in the end they are fine anyway because you know they yeah. reverse the flow of some power cell. Yeah. So I'll I'll take I'll, I'll take a little more medit thoughtful meditative uh, scenes than um, the overflash. So this is the first of five videos we're going to do on what makes good science fiction and fantasy. We're also going to cover characters, plot, aesthetics, which is the tech and the special effects and all that, and then putting it all together. Mm -hmm. But I think it begins with world building. You can't do anything else right. until you have a world to put everything into. To me, it's the single most important aspect of, of a franchise, certainly. Um, and you know the and you could totally see it. You have the, either a deep three-dimensional rich world or a flat superficial world. And we will be referring back to this 
in later reviews of specific movies. One coming up in particular, yep. I thought it was an example of horrible world building, but we'll talk about that. And any other final thoughts? Uh, just one thing. I mean, in our own world, look at the look at our own sense of history. I yeah. went to Germany a couple of years ago, and uh, I was taking a river cruise, and you see modern German villages um, uh, on the coast, and then above you see medieval castles, several hundred years old, and then above that there's a Roman wall uh -huh. that's like two thousand years yeah. old. There's your world building right there. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, around us, and that should inform creative um, decisions and creative uh, endeavors. Totally, hope totally. Took, I hope you took a picture of that. I that took, sounds <laughs> awesome. Yes, yeah, so I basically recorded the entire show, so I can make a movie about Brian and Jordan. There, there is so much inspiration to be had by the absolutely rich world that yeah. we actually live in. You could never even get to that level of depth, you know, with right. with, with fiction, but it's, it's all, the inspiration is all there. Absolutely. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, you can go to Alpha Quadrant and the number six dot com where you can see past episodes that we've made. We have quite the catalog behind us at this point. We also turn this show into a podcast so you can listen to it as you're driving home. And on top of that, if you like science fiction, speculative fiction, if you like a lot of the things that are going on in, in TV today, we cover it. So please do join us. And thanks. We'll see you next week.